Todavía espero que sí. Esta es la próxima. Sí, me doy cuenta de que hace calor quizás acá. Así que bueno, creo que... Um, our colleagues in Peru. The next bit that I really want to get to grips with is the hazard impact modeling side. Now, of the options that I showed in the previous one, it's potentially the one with the most detail and the most complicated. Um, the main reason for that is that not necessarily scientifically the most complicated, but in terms of what you need to make it work. So in terms of collaboration, data, timeliness, communication, all those things. So. I'm going to go straight in. Um, oh, yes. No, this is not the right one. Sorry. This is not the right presentation. <laughs> We have skipped to the wrong one. Start again. So, in this one, we're going to go through how do we quantify hazard, how do we quantify vulnerability and exposure, risk, um, and how we use this to support weather warnings, the key challenges, benefits of hazard impact modeling, and impact based evaluation. So, please don't be scared. Um, so, when we're talking about hazard impact modeling, um, it's a, it's a the main reason for looking at it is to help with the automation of that process we talked about in the first one, where we are deciding where to put the tick in the box on the matrix. So, we know that hazards in and of themselves may not lead to an impact. So, we need to understand the vulnerability and exposures. We need to understand what the impacts might be so that we can understand risk. Now, Most of you will be aware that there is a well-recognized approach for doing that calculation, a risk algorithm. It is hazard, you multiply it by vulnerability, and you multiply it by exposure. Now, you can do this calculation broad scale. You can do this very fine scale. You can do it for a single asset. You can look at it from a single impact. You can look at it from a specific user viewpoint. So, there are a number of decisions that have to be made. But the main things to consider and the main things to, to focus on is that you are using this method to identify areas and assets which are most vulnerable to the hazard. You're helping to prioritize where and when to deploy responder services. Help to prioritize areas that, to watch and spatially and temporally identify area of greatest risk. Now, sounds simple-ish, um, but obviously we know already there are lots of caveats, there are lots of challenges here. Um, so, we're going to go through with some illustrators. And again, this is a lot from a research perspective. So, um, you are very welcome to shout and say, that sounds ridiculous at any point. So, illustrator one, this is the vehicle overturning model. Now, in the UK, we have some very strong winds. They often interact with our transport network, and we can have numbers of vehicles being blown over. These are often um, lorries, so heavy goods vehicles. Now, that can cause both disruption to the transport network. We have a lot of country roads, which are sort of very small, You often then have to travel huge distances around, so it can be really annoying. Um, this model was a, a very preliminary um, prototype to be able to test the theory of doing hazard, impact, exposure to get risk. And the reason we chose it was because we were already working with a university that was looking at transport. <laughs> and they were doing research on transport impacts. And so we were able to have a quick and easy collaboration with an organization who had expertise in transportation and log logistics. So, the hazard impact model is basically looking, defining a hazard footprint. In this case, we're interested in wind. <laughs> um, 
We also then want to look at the vulnerability. Now, this is the vulnerability associated with the road itself, so the asset or the receptor. Um, and then we want to look at the exposure. So in this instance, exposure is the people who are using that asset, so the, the cars on the road and the people driving those cars. And I bet you're all thinking, so where do we get the data from for that? Um, and I will tell you in a second. And the output from that is this. And this, hap this is a, a, a risk of disruption. Um, and you can have this for numerous forecast time steps. Um, you can then summarize it as well uh, to give you an overview of what the risk to the transport network might be. So in case any of you are not aware of what the transport network looks like in the UK, this is our major trunk road network, just so you're aware. So defining the hazard. Now, I think it was hopefully um, apparent from the last presentation, but there's lots of different ways that you can identify a hazard. Um, and forecasters routinely might use a lot of different options here. So there are operational forecasting techniques that look at the physical meteorology. There are statistical-based methods that might look at frequency and historical data. There's climatologically-based thresholds. And then there's impact-based thresholds. And this is what I want to focus on for this illustrator, because we used impact-based thresholds in this example. And I just wanted to, <laughs> we had a discussion, myself and James, earlier about the variety of different uh, terminologies that have been floating around. For the project that we've been involved in, we are using the UNISDR <laughs> terminology. This is what they define as a hazard. Now. For all intents and purposes, I think we can all agree that we recognize what a hazard is, uh, a process phenomena, human activity that may cause loss of life, injury, or other health impacts. Um, if anybody has a massive problem with that, then obviously shout out. So. But this is what we have used for this prototype. So, as I said, when we started this work, we were already in a collaboration with an academic institution, Birmingham University. They have expertise in doing um, transportation and logistics research. That's where their focus is. They are typically engineers, and they're a fun bunch of people to work with. But when we came to them and said, we have this issue, we, we, you know, we'd like to understand a little bit more about how um, wind affects transport. And they were like, oh, that's interesting. We've actually been looking at that for rail, which was great. Um, but we were specifically interested in transport from the road. So they had already started to look at a mechanical model for how a vehicle is overturned. They'd done a number of tests in a wind tunnel. What are the, con what are the things that trigger a, a vehicle to be overturned in strong winds? Things like the size of the vehicle, the weight of the vehicle, um, whether the road is tilted or not tilted, um, the, the speed the vehicle is traveling at. All of these things have an influence on whether a vehicle will be overturned. And based on their analysis, they were able to derive for us, which is very helpful, some accident gust speeds. So these speeds were relative to different vehicle types. So this is a high-sided vehicle unloaded, a loaded high-sided vehicle, a van, small, small van, um, and a car. Um, and we were able to develop different thresholds for different vehicle types. It's pretty specific. Um, and based on that, we could use these impact-based thresholds to define hazard footprints. So this is an example of what we would get out, raw model output from a model, um, and then how this then relates to those impacts. So this red area here is where all vehicle thresholds have been exceeded in this case. So we would anticipate that there would be some impacts to the road network in that instance. Now, obviously, there are lots of caveats here. We don't know the camber or the curvature of the road at very high resolution. We can't guarantee that we're going to be able to have the resolution of the model to be able to factor in things like turbulence. Uh, we don't necessarily know if we're going to be able to capture aspects of the intricacies around vehicle weight, the size of the vehicle, things like that. So how do we go forward with this? We have these great thresholds that have come from an engineer. We can now take these forward. 
Now we have that footprint, but we want to relate it to the vulnerability and the exposure. And again, there's more than one way to quantify vulnerability, and I'm sure you're all aware of this. Um, you can include vulnerability data overlays in a, in a, in a tool. You can have preconditioning data layers, so this might be antecedent conditions, that's classed as a vulnerability. Vulnerability indices, and also impact libraries. And these are all different ways of being able to quantify vulnerability. Again, um, just to highlight, uh, we're using this definition of vulnerability. Uh, the conditions determined by physical, social, economic, and environmental factors or processes which increase the susceptibility of an individual community, asset or system to the impacts. Um, again, it's as long as we're all on the same page and we understand kind of what we mean by vulnerability, I am happy for the purposes of this. So what is a vulnerability index? Now you may have come across these before. There's many, they are used for lots of different things. Um, but typically it tries to measure the variability in population exposure. Um, and they are typically related to a specific hazard. Often, because vulnerability in and of itself is not a unit of measure, it is um, a combination of different data sets. So it's a composite, effectively. And the idea in, for our purposes is that we somehow bring together these different layers of information and make a numerical output that we can ingest with the hazard, in, with the hazard footprints. So there's the, the coastal vulnerability index is one, the social vulnerability index, disaster risk um, index, um, human development index. All of these different indexes will include different data layers. They will be specific for different users. Um, some will be more socially um, uh, related. Some will be more environmental related. And it just depends which one you might want to use for your, for your model. But for our intense purposes, there wasn't a road transport vulnerability data set. So we had to make our own. So how would we go about doing that? Um, this is some work that was done um, and not by Birmingham University, but a related institute. And this is a, a, a diagram that shows the kinds of things that are relevant to the vulnerability of a road transport network. So the structure, the topology, the curvature, the width, things like this will influence how um, it's able to cope with wind being in, interacted with it. Um, the nature, uh, the types of hazards that could affect it, the terrain, the topography, and the traffic, maintenance, accidents, and flow. These are all kinds of aspects that would be, lead to different degrees of vulnerability upon the road network. Um, and I just wanted to highlight some of the questions that we went through from a scientific perspective. So what are the indicators that make one vehicle more likely to overturn than another? And again, we've already discussed the aerodynamics of a vehicle. Is there data available to explain these factors? So do we have information on different vehicle sizes, different weights, the numbers of vehicles on the road? Do we have this? Um, what is the update frequency of the vulnerability indicators? So do we need to factor that into our, to our product? What aggregation method should we use? And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the development of an impact, uh, a vulnerability index, but there are, again, numerous options there. <laughs> um, and what is the uh, appropriate spatial and temporal scale? So obviously for us, we're very interested in the road network. We are also interested in a national scale vulnerability index that can be applied across the whole country. So this was what we came up with. We basically didn't want to make it too complicated and we didn't want to make it too easy. So we went for some middle ground. We generated a vulnerability index with values between zero and one. Low vulnerability is zero and one is high vulnerability. And we included four different aspects that were related to the road network. The first being the altitude of the road. If you are a higher elevated road, you will likely get stronger winds. You will therefore likely have more vehicles overturned. The number of lanes. Now, one of the things that's often picked up is resilience. Um, so in this regard, by the number of lanes, in the UK, if you have a motorway with two lanes, 
and you have a vehicle overturn it, they likely close the road. However, if you have a motorway with six lanes, they will likely keep it open, but you will just go very slowly down the side. So you don't, there's a different level there of impact. The specific road attribute. Now, if I'm thinking about wind, and my bit section of road is in a tunnel, I probably don't need to worry about my vehicle overturning. I'm probably safe. But if I'm on a bridge or a viaduct, then that's, that's a bit more problematic, and I might want to think about that. So we had some specific road attributes. The other thing to include here is where there were portions of road where you couldn't travel at the speed required for a vehicle to be overturned. That, again, is important. Um, and then also road orientation. So if your road happens to align with the direction, so the broad side of the vehicle, the fat side of the vehicle, if that is the one that is facing the wind, it's more likely to overturn than if it's heading into it. So that direction is really important. So these were the factors that we included. And we developed this vulnerability index, and as you can see uh, here, these roads are across the Pennines in the, in the UK. So these are high elevation areas. Um, and this was the intuitive work that we did with our collaborators at the university. And this allows us then to relate this variability in, it, in the vulnerability with the hazard impact. And these are pre-calculated. So we have this now. And we can update it on an annual basis or as frequently as we want. And the process by which we do it is each one of these has a zero to one rating, and then it's normalized, the aggregation is then normalized over the whole of the UK. So this is where the scale aspect comes in. Because if you were to um, reprocess this just over Wales, for example, you might get a very different vulnerability index compared to if you do it over the whole of the country. So considering scale at the development phase is really important if you use this method. So, the last component, expo uh, exposure. Um, and again, we're just using the UNISDR um, terminology here. And I won't read it out again. <laughs> so, exposure. We're really interested, as I said before, in the number of vehicles that are using the road network. Now, in the UK, we're actually very lucky. Um, we have the Department for Transport, and they're fabulous in the sense that they collect a lot of data and they make it freely available. So we have information. This is a website where they have count point data. So at each of these points, they have um, a record of the number of vehicles that are traveling along that route. They also have information that shows how, the, how vehicles traveling on that route vary by time of day. So we can start to look at, OK, during rush hour, which might be intuitive, um, we have peaks in when there are numbers of vehicles on the road. What's interesting is that for goods vehicles, you don't get the dual peak. You don't get a morning and an evening peak. You just get an all-day peak. So this, this has an influence then on the exposure for those different hazard thresholds that we mentioned earlier. And again, we've got an exposure score or exposure value between zero and one. And this is for unloaded heavy goods vehicles. And you can see that there are certain routes here that have high numbers of those vehicles on them compared to the rest of the UK. So you would be highlighting these as particularly exposed to certain level of hazard. It's, it's a good starting point anyway. So. Going back to this slide, we now have a zero to one probability hazard footprint. We have a vulnerability footprint, and we have an exposure. And we can now aggregate that information to produce a risk. And this is what we would get. So we have, we have chosen to use a low risk low to medium, medium to high, high risk. So we're doing a qualitative assessment here. There's no um, calculation of the actual anticipated impact. It is, it is a true risk from that perspective. Um, and the forecasters can use this. They can see this every day. It updates frequently. Um, 
And as I say, this was an illustrator for us. It was so that we could see whether this was physically possible for us to do, whether we could update it on a regular basis. And we have now made this available to our embedded forecasters who sit within the transport agency. So the Highways England, they were really interested in this from their logistic point of view. And so they, they like to be able to see the output from this model. Now this was a case in point where this became really useful. So we had a warning on the 9th of January and originally the forecasters had it like that. So you had an amber warning in the north. Yeah, in the north of England, uh, Scotland, sorry. Um, and then a broader area of yellow. Now, when we looked at the vehicle overturning model, we realized that there was actually some high risk of vehicle disruption in the central belt of Scotland, which had not been flagged in the original warning. Um, and because of the output from the vehicle overturning model, they actually updated the warning to include an amber around this very dense area of, it's actually a very dense area around Glasgow. Um, and there were a number of transport incidents. So this was the, as I say, this was where we had um, an evaluation, a post-event evaluation. We gathered some information. These, these little colors here, dots, these show where we had recorded incidents of vehicle overturning and or disruption. So the information was obtained from news, media, um, and Twitter, which I think we've all mentioned might be useful. Um, we also had purple circles, which were identified from Highways England, and then green circles came from, excuse me, <coughs> came from uh, the Met Office weather observation website. Um, and I think James mentioned this yesterday or the day before. Um, this is where we can have members of the general public putting in information about their impacts that they're experiencing. Now, you'll see that on the whole, we had, yes, events happening in the high-risk areas that we had identified. We also had some here and here. And then we also had some down here. Now, this is one of the things to highlight when we're doing post-event um, evaluation. Um, <laughs> You can often get very spurious results when you are obtaining your impact evaluation information from either news media, Twitter, or even when you're getting it from reputable sources. Now, that might be the police, for example. So when we've had records from the police before, they have a, when they go to any accident, they have to fill in a form. And on that form, there is a tick box. You can say what the weather might be like. Now. We think in this instance that the people who had responded to this event had seen that there was a weather warning out and just looked about, yeah, it's windy, but that actually those impacts were not at all related to the weather. I mean, they might have been, maybe we were wrong, but we, th we don't think that they were. So, and this is one of the things about quality assurance and quality control. Can you trust the impact information that you're looking at when you're doing post-event evaluation? So that's just a highlight. Right, I hope that everyone's still awake. <laughs> so, Illustrator 2. Now this one may be slightly more relevant in the sense that it is a broader piece of work. Um, it's not looking at a single asset um, in terms of impacts to one road network. It's looking at assets over, impacts over a number of assets. And this is something that is now going through to be an operational model. So we've had it in test, and we're now generating an operational model from it. So defining the hazard. We are not using impact-based thresholds for this model. We are using climatologically-based thresholds. Um, uh, return periods, actually, is what we are using. So as I mentioned, this piece of work has done in collaboration between the Met Office, the Center for Ecology and Hydrology, uh, the Flood Forecasting Center, the Environment Agency, um, and the Health and Safety Executive. So it's not a small group of people, but we need all of those people to make this work. So the Center for Ecology and Hydrology have this grid-to-grid um, -grid model, um, which allows us to model um, surface runoff related to specific events. So the input to this would be the Met Office um, high-resolution rainfall inputs. 
Now, we would use the ensemble for this. Um, this model uses spatial data sets on terrain, um, soil geology and land cover. Um, it responds to spatial variation of rainfall, and it's used operationally anyway across Britain um, at a one kilometer resolution um, with 15 minute intervals. So this is what we use to derive our hazard footprint. Now, in a different, the last one, the last illustrator I showed, had hazard, vulnerability, and exposure. This is different in that it uses an impact library. Now, I don't know if any of you will have come across the term impact library, um, but it's a pre-calculated assessment of what we anticipate impacts would be related to certain return period events from flooding. So, again, in the UK, we are very, very lucky. There's been a lot of work to develop um, flood maps for surface water. Now, if you look here, these are buildings, and this is the anticipated flooded area related to different return periods of flood event. Um, we can use this information to be able to look at worst case scenario flooding, and this can help us to build the impact library. So, because we have those initial flood maps, and we can look at that in regard to what we would expect the depth from that flooding to be and the velocity of that flooding to be, taken forward using that grid-to-grid -grid output, we can start to count what the impacts might be. So, for those, um, for those different return periods that I mentioned, we can start to look at how many residential properties would be classed as flooded, how many non-residential properties, the day population within those properties, the night population, key sites. So if you're interested in the schools, electricity substations, uh, police places, anything like that, that might be a key uh, piece of infrastructure that you really cannot lose to flooding, that would go in here. Um, the infrastructure location, the trunk road lengths, other roads that might be also critical, um, and the rail length. Now, again, as I said, we happen to be very lucky in the UK. The health and safety executive who work with us on this project have done a number of pieces of work developing these receptor data sets and these population data sets. And it allows us to be able to look at these counts at very high resolution, down to like two meters. Now, the reason why we do this offline is because of the detail in that flood map that I showed you before and how we quantify what is going to be flooded and what's not going to be flooded. So we're looking at the proportion of each building <laughs> that are going to be flooded. That's a lot of processing power for any computer. Um, and that's why we do this as pre-calculated events. So. When we're thinking about those impacts, we might have counted them all up in our head, but actually, do we know what that means in terms of severity? We have 300 buildings. Is that high? Is that low? I don't know. Um, and so we had, to do a dis we had to do a piece of work that looked at how do we um, define severity for those impacts. So this was the table that um, has been used. And um, if anyone's really interested in the methodologies around the development, of impact libraries, I will, at the end of this presentation, there are a number of references that you can go to, but Aldridge et al are the people who have been doing this work, and I encourage you to, to read that. It's really interesting. Um, but we have, have identified different levels of one kilometer squared impact, and this is based on counts. So how many buildings? So we would class minor danger to life. The daytime population, we're looking at 40. Uh, nighttime population, 40. Residential buildings, five. Non-residential, one. And it, it's this kind of assessment that we really need the responders to help us with this. So in this regard, the health and safety executive could provide us the data, but we needed the additional input from responders and from other scientists to be able to tell us what levels this reflects. And again, this comes back to, I think we mentioned this earlier. Um, we need to know whether this is a business as usual event in terms of what they'll have to deal with or something that's going to put severe strain. And that's what we're trying to get at here. 
So once we've classified our impacts, then we need to look at aggregation because there's not, no chance that we're going to be able to review two meter level data, de detailed data um, for all different ensemble members. But you know, we don't want to make it more complicated for a forecaster, we want to make it easier. So we need to do some aggregation. So we use a multi-criteria analysis um, to aggregate the impact severity levels across the impact, cri impact criteria. Now the thing to be mindful here is that for different hazards, and it's not the case here, but for different hazards, you might have um, different uh, impacts and different severities. So if you were to look at snow, for example, snow very rarely produces damage in the UK but it does cause issues with denial of access, lack of water, lack of electricity, cannot travel, things like that. Wind and flooding are more likely to cause damage. And so when you're doing your aggregation and your impact severity classification, you need to be mindful of those differences. So once you've done our aggregation, we need to start to think about, well, what are we aggregating over? For what purpose? Now, when we were discussing with the Flood Forecasting Centre, who used this, they were predominantly interested in, we want it to be administrative boundary level information. So for us, county level in the UK, which I think may be municipality level here. Um, so that was the level they wanted to look at. But they did also want to be able to have access to the underlying data. So that's when it becomes tricky. So we were able to produce both the one kilometer grid cells and also an aggregated summary at the boundary, at the county boundary. So bringing all of that together, <laughs> once again, we're using the same structure. We have a hazard footprint. It's been defined by the return period and it's temporally varying, spatially varying. We then have our pre-calculated impact library. So every event that we have forecast where surface water is imminent, we then look at, okay, what are the impacts that we might expect? We count them up and we give it a severity. This is what our final output impact is. So impacts are selected on a pixel by pixel basis from the impact library and then are aggregated to fulfill the flood risk matrix, which is subtly different to the National Severe Weather Warning one. Um, but it still fulfills the same criteria. And the output then is that you have this regional summary map, which looks great on a map, but you then underneath that have the detail of those grids if you want to look at them. And this is what it feeds into. We effectively have a flood guidance statement. Um, it actually deals with all types of flooding, so coastal flooding, fluvial flooding, um, and also surface water flooding. Now, this was a particularly busy day. <laughs> There's lots of things going on here. But the idea is that because you have lots of things going on, you want to be able to have a consistent, robust way of being able to fulfill that matrix on a routine basis. Now, I just want to illustrate that this is not st static, and I think we're all aware of that, but this illustrates how we ramped up to an event in terms of the transition through the matrix. So, the flood guidance statement on Tuesday was here. Based on, our, based on the surface runoff information that we had, um, we were not very concerned. Then when we moved to um, Wednesday, we had moved into a significant impact, but it was still very low likelihood. And then as time progressed through the forecast and we had more runs of information, we transitioned through the matrix, we moved up, and we moved into the amber area. And this is when we start to think we might need to engage a lot more with our external partners. So. You know, we've been having discussions already, but now we might need to ramp up those discussions around what we're gonna actually issue. And then, as I say, when we moved up into the red zone, which is actually very rare for us to issue a red, um, we are starting to have updates a lot more frequently and a lot more engagement with our end users about what is actually happening on the ground. 
so that we can validate that what we're saying is being useful and is actually happening. So that's just an illustration of two different types of hazard impact modeling. Now, I'm not expecting you to have picked up everything there, some of the subtleties, and I'm happy if any of you would like to have a follow-up discussion at any point, I'm more than happy with that. Um, as I say, I've provided references at the end, so if you are really interested and want to read some more, you go ahead. I would be delighted. <laughs> so um, I think the thing I'd like to highlight is that we... There are both challenges and benefits to the process. So hazard impact modeling, as is and of itself, is it's not a small task. It's, uh, it's something that you, you know, will have to work at, as we have done. Um, and some of you are already in there. I can already see some of, the, some of the bits that you've worked on which fulfill these criteria. So this is great. So you are probably already aware of some of the challenges here. So data processing and optimization. Um, is a major challenge for this type of work. And this is why I say that we have different approaches. The first approach we run real time through the whole process. So the vulnerability and exposure data is put through every single ensemble member. For the surface water flooding, the impact libraries are pre-calculated because they are just, there is too complicated. There's too much data in there to be processed routinely four times or eight times a day, depending on how frequently your update model is. So there has to be some decisions around data processing and optimization. Um, data availability and update frequency. Now, when we get into warning issuance, there are already operating procedures in place for that. So we're not necessarily too worried about that side of it. What we are interested in is how often do we need to update the baseline data that we are using to define risk? So how often is the hazard being reviewed? The hazard thresholds that we have defined, the impact thresholds that we develop for the vehicle overturning model, or the climatological thresholds that we use for surface water flooding, how often are we going back and reevaluating whether that is still an appropriate threshold? Also, with the vulnerability and exposure data, vulnerability, as we saw, can have a number of different sub-data layers that make up a single index. How often are we reviewing those data layers to make sure they're being updated and are relevant to the current situation on the ground? And there's been some work in the US, I believe, about how we can do updating of those data sets using numbers of social media data. So again, lots of opportunities coming up. Um, uncertainty propagation. Um, again, this really depends on where your capabilities are. A lot of the uncertainty that we've talked about with regard to the um, matrix has been uncertainty derived from hazard, just hazard. Um, obviously, we recognize, and we've mentioned it before, that we often think that we are not capturing the uncertainty inherent in the, uh, in the vulnerability and exposure data sets. So for example, in the vehicle overturning model, we have statistically forced annual average daily flow data. So th that data set is produced on an annual basis. We statistically force it to represent the changing daily cycle of traffic distribution on the network. Now, obviously, there are gonna be issues with that on a bank holiday. For example, you have a very different exposure. The other thing to mention is that in the UK, I don't know if you have it here, we have a lot of caravans. And when it's summertime, we have a lot of people with a huge trailer at the back of them, which is very prone to being turned over and flipped about, and it's crazy. And I happen to live in an area of the UK that is a beautiful place to go on holiday with your caravan. But every time it's windy, we will have an event that will close a road and I can't get home. <laughs> so those kind of things are things that are need to be um, factored in when you're looking at your update frequency, your availability of data. Now, it's not to say that we want to get down to the nitty gritty of every detail, but we need to be aware of the caveats and the assumptions within our hazard impact model when we develop it. So, um, scale and relevance. Uh, I think we mentioned this, colleague from Peru, thank you. Um, so, this is a very important depending on what you want to output at the end. So, if your predominant interest 
is to be able to understand risk at the national scale. It is likely that you will be developing vulnerability indices um, and exposure indices that are relevant to the national scale risk. If you are interested at a local level, then you will probably have to be looking at a slightly different index production process. Um, it doesn't mean that the, the actual methodology has to change, but you might have to have different considerations. Uh, it's just something to be aware of. Uh, communication of risk, I think we've mentioned this already. Um, there's quite a big difference between communicating the impact information to comparing the risk assessment. Um, and one of the things, if you were to look at the two methods I illustrated, the vehicle overturning does not explicitly calculate the impact at any point. The vulnerability is an index, the exposure is an index. There is no calculation of anticipated impact. It is just the, the, the risk, as it were, which is a probability of impact, as we were talking about earlier. But it, it hasn't, you haven't, you couldn't pull out from that the number of cars that will be overturned, for example. The number of cars that will be disrupted, you couldn't do that from the vehicle overturning model. You could do that from the surface water flooding model because you have the impact library that is based on the counts of properties, the counts of roads. So in that regard, you, have a, you can offer different information to communicate, should you wish to. Um, Impact-based evaluation. I'm going to leave this one for a second because I'm going to come on to that in the next bit. So, benefits. The biggest benefits I think that we have found by doing this work is that A, we realized we could not do this as a meteorological organization without input from others. It would have been impossible to do. Um, and because of that, we have had a huge growth in interagency collaboration. And this has not just been in terms of hazard impact modeling. This has extended our scientific innovation in a lot of different areas. We have been able to do research um, into landslides into a lot more detail than we ever would have previously because we now have an excellent working relationship with the British Geological Survey. I think I was talking to someone earlier. I do not go a week without talking to a colleague at the Geological Survey. And, and that's how we're close we are now in terms of working together. Um, the Flood Forecasting Centre, which issues the Flood Guidance Statement, which I showed earlier, is an actual linked collaborative centre between the Environment Agency and the Met Office. They physically sit together in the same room. They are working together to produce those guidance statements. Um, the second thing on the list is a transition in mindset, and I think this was mentioned on the first day. Um, the when I very first joined uh, the office, there was a very big, the, the word risk was used very much colloquially. Um, risk was very much the, the likelihood of an event happening. It was very much a probability. It was not really ever considered that the consequences should be factored into that. Now, coming from a risk background myself, this was sort of a step back and whoa, okay, so you don't look at consequences, you're just, you're using risk just to mean probability, that's, mm, okay. Um, but there has been a huge paradigm shift, a huge change, and this is fantastic for us because now we are able to have these dialogues with all these different organizations where we are talking about risk in the same way, which is great. So, um, the third thing, Improved understanding of how impacts occur relative to different hazards. Now, as I mentioned before, for all of the models that I've mentioned, for um, all of the different approaches, one of the critical things has been development of impact information. Where do we get it from? Um, how do we record it? Do we map it, process it, analyze it? Before this, we were not routinely looking at impact information. We were not routinely talking with organizations that collected impact information. But now, we are regularly talking to those organizations and we are able to do analysis on numerous different things. For example, we have been looking at the relationship between um, heat and heat stress on the population. So um, popula people going to the hospital with heat stress, people going who have suffered from increased dehydration problems like that. Um, 
In another, in a more economically viable situation, we've been looking at how different hazards affect the electricity transmission network. Now, before this, we, we would have, but we maybe would have looked at it from a climatological perspective. But now we are able to actually have this dialogue with them where they will share their data on the customer minutes lost, which is fantastic. This is real data on the impacts that we're seeing. And so we can start to build the relationships between hazard and impact. Um, improved communication and relevance of severe weather information for end users. Um, I think there has been a number of studies. Um, <coughs> excuse me. A number of studies um, by social scientists who can confirm that by adding impact information into the warning communication really helps users to be able to take more effective action. Not in every case, but broadly speaking, it helps. The, I actually had a conversation before I left that this improvement is seen even further if you start to include action information as well. And this again comes back to your dialogue with your responder communities and your end users. Um, if you can start to put into your warning information not only what the impacts might be, but also what likely actions could be taken to mitigate it, more people are likely to take heed of that information and actually act upon it. Because all the information is there, right? They don't have to pre-process in their mind. If you're a busy person who has to go pick up the kids, you don't want to have to go, OK, so it's raining. It's raining quite a lot. I might not be able to go get the kids. Do I have to go a different way? You don't have to process that. You just want to know, do I need to do something and what should I do? So this has really improved the communication. So the final thing that I wanted to bring up, because it came up a lot yesterday and is relevant to all of the models that we have talked about so far, is impact-based evaluation. Um, and I'm just going to take a step back a little bit because the work that we've done here is on a global scale, related to the global hazard map, actually. Um, and it's not UK focused, so I, I just wanted to highlight, highlight that. And the reason I highlight that is because this is not um, impact-based evaluation for the sake of understanding what the impacts actually were. Thank you. <laughs> I will be quick, I promise. Um, this is more to understand whether um, the baseline capability of the models, as they are, can capture those high impact events and the impacts that we might see. So why are we doing impact-based evaluation? Understand the baseline capability of high impact weather modeling, assess the value of additional data integration processes, and for real time sanity checking, all of these things are relevant. The thing I would say, and I mentioned this uh, the other day, if your warning is successful, you anticipate your impacts to go down. So if you forecast a high impact event and then you're expecting to verify it as a high impact event, you're assuming that your warning message does nothing, which is not what you want. You want to see a downward trend there. So impact-based evaluation is really important for these three things, but not necessarily to verify your impact forecast, just to be clear. So, um, we've already gone through this, and I think I won't go through this again, but this is the global hazard map. It has lots of forecast information in it. It's all probabilistic. The thing I want to make clear, uh, this, we wanted to verify whether the high impact weather events that we had identified did actually relate to socioeconomic impacts on the ground. Because we want to understand the baseline capability and how we can improve upon it. Now, as I say, this is purely forecast information. You could look at it from the perspective of what does the vulnerability data do, but that's not what we did for this evaluation. So I'm going to skip past this. But basically, the thing to be aware of is that we're verifying against these polygons. That's just so you know what we're verifying against. So, I thought the card was waving again. Um, how well do high impact weather forecasts actually relate to community impacts? We've done this looking at heavy rainfall and heat waves and cold waves. Um, and we wanted to do a semi-automated approach because, to be quite honest, we don't have enough people in our group to do this manually every single time we want to do an evaluation. It's physically impossible. So, we wanted to try and come up with a semi-automated approach. 
uh, the things that we needed to be able to do that. We needed to have an archive of our model forecasts. We needed a geospatial database of historical community impacts. We wanted to then assess and capture the impact database uncertainty and compare the forecast high impact weather events against the recorded impacts that we had seen. So, how do we produce the community impact database? Now we are, once again, I feel sorry saying this, but we're very lucky in the UK. <laughs> um, the Public Health England actually maintains a, a global hazard weekly bulletin. Any of you can access this. Um, and it's basically a weekly summary of where there have been recorded impacts around the world. Um, now, a lot of it's from media, and it's links to media outlets. So you would go to the... You would go to that, click on it, and then you have to read through the, the information in the media article and pull out the relevant information. Now, what is the relevant information? So, we would like to have an ID for the event. We need to have a record date. We need to know when this impact was, because otherwise we cannot cross-compare it with the forecast. It's also useful to have a start date and an end date for the event because that allows you to see how far forward and back in the forecast you might need to be verifying against. The hazard type, now in this case, as I say, we were mainly focused on heavy rainfall, but what's useful to also add is were there secondary hazards? Because when we were looking at heavy rainfall, we noticed that often the impacts were caused by either flooding or landslides. And so it's important to, as we were saying before, attribution of impact is really crucial. Uh, we also then need a, a location, so country name, region, state, province, and latitude and longitude for the location of the impact, um, and then the impact information, because if we don't have that, we can't categorize the impact. So, assuming that we've collected all of that, which is no mean feat, <laughs> um, you can then generate a spatial database. So this is the location of heavy rainfall impacts between February and December 2015, based on sources of information that we have here. Um, as I say, this is currently being maintained by myself and a colleague. We do it on an ad hoc basis. Um, we have other databases. I can see a face nodding. Um, but the reason we needed, <coughs> the reason we, we looked at other databases, so we looked at EMDAT, we looked at um, a number of other um, the Glide database has, has a number. They did not all hold the relevant information. And this is something that I'm sure we will discuss at a later point. <laughs> <laughs> so, once we had this, we could then do some impact, um, uh, impact assessment. I'm really sorry. I, I will be really quick, I promise. <laughs> um, so, we, <laughs> we then had to categorize in our... Um, our database, what was classified as low, what was classified as moderate, high, and disastrous. Um, and as you can see, because we're looking at a global scale here, they're, they're pretty broad classifications. Um, and I am not going to lie to you that the way that this was done was by looking through a full year's worth of data and then saying, how does that com compare to those? And we basically said, that looks about right. But if we were to change any of these, we would get very different results. So, for example, the high impact category, and I think I was talking about this at lunch uh, with our American colleagues, <laughs> um, is one or more fatality. Now, um, when we were looking at events in the impact database and classifying them, we found that there were some very localized heavy rainfall events in America um, that on a normal day would have been classified as low impact. but a person decided to drive through flooded water, and then they got washed away. This is one person, only one fatality, but because of that, it moved the event into the high impact category. So the question is, were we accurately describing that event in terms of impact categorization? Um, and I would say no, but we have to decide later. So once we have this impact categorization, we can then do comparisons against our forecast polygons. 
And the output that we wanted to get down the bottom here is a proportion of the number of times that the forecast accurately intersected with where impacts were. And as you can see, for different levels of impact, the global hazard map performed differently at different lead times in the forecast. Now at this point, we were using a static probability threshold. And it was the same probability threshold was used for all lead times. So you would expect this drop off. What we have actually swapped to now is a time and hazard varying probability threshold so that we can more accurately pick up high, potentially high impact events at the longer lead times. But what's interesting here is that we did better capturing the moderate and low impacts than we did at capturing the high impacts in our model. So the next stage for us will be to see if we do this comparison again, but we start to include vulnerability and exposure data into the production of the polygons in the global hazard map, could we improve upon this? And how would, how would we improve that? How much could we improve that? So this is just to illustrate some of the work that's being done. This kind of um, impact database creation and the, the way that we're doing automated um, assessments has become really important also for the hazard impact modeling work that we're doing at the UK scale. Um, and we are shortly to be publishing this um, in a journal. So if you are interested in developing impact based uh, impact databases, then they might be of use and you're happy to look at that. Um, so I think the, the main things to pick up on are um, when we're creating a database is things to consider. The diversity of hazard and impact terminology. So when we were looking globally, the term heat wave and cold wave are not universally recognized the same way. <laughs> I like people going, no, that's right. Um, also, uh, the spellings of things, the way that you might want to collect data, it's, you have to consider that landslide is not landslide to everybody. Some people it's landslip, some people it is land, space slide. Obviously, you will have your own nuances in your own language that you will have to pick up on when you come to generate your database. Um, the impacts... Um, are, they're a product of complex and interactive environmental and social conditions. And so when you're looking at attribution, you need to be really careful that what you're looking at is the impact from the real event that you're trying to forecast. Because if you're trying to compare the impacts that were derived from one event that's totally separate, and then you're comparing it against your forecast, well, of course, they're not going to match. And if they do match, that's more luck than anything else. So you need to be careful of that. Um, we're also talking about relatively rare events. So in our database for the year that we had, I think for heavy rainfall events, we had around 845 separate records over the whole globe, which is not, not that many really. And thank goodness for that, to be quite honest, because manually doing that was really laborious. So, um, but this is what I'm saying. You don't have a huge amount of data to play with. So um, you need to be careful on that. Um, the quantity and quality of the records, we really struggled to make sure that every uh, record that we included had a date, a location, and details about the impact. Because if you don't have that, you can't classify what type of severity you're dealing with. And if you can't do that, you can't then look at how that relates to your forecast. So, continuing development. We are currently doing a project with Exeter University where we are now looking at how we can use social media to recreate that database that we produced to do this analysis. We are going to try and create the same database purely from social media. And we're going to compare the two to see whether they produce similar outputs. We anticipate a hypothesis, as you would, that the social media derived data set will produce higher volumes but less detail. And so you may have more difficulty in doing impact classification from it. So we will see. It's all, it's all to be examined. Right. And I know you're all ready for coffee. <laughs> oh. Hola.
Hello. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much.